You are locked on to another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and we got three big segments to get into tonight. Alec Marsh just made his second big league start last night in Minnesota. Do we think he's a starter or reliever? And maybe looking at some of these younger players, are there any extension candidates? I'll tell you that in our second segment. And lastly, another draft prospect we like, this time from the University of Arizona. All of that coming up next on Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. And we want to thank you, the listener, for making Locked On Royals your first listen every day, whether that be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or you check us out on YouTube. All I ask is that you hit that follow or subscribe button and get that daily content because we're bringing it to you Monday through Friday, every single day of the week, all things you can want in regards to the Kansas City Royals. And a shout out to our Title sponsor today's show in Sleeper. Are you into fantasy baseball? Sleeper is the way to go. I'll give you a couple of my picks for later on tonight. For those nightcap games, I was dangerously close to getting both my picks right yesterday. The only thing I needed was Cor- Corbin Carroll to get a stolen base. But I was right on Alex Cobb. He threw more than five innings, had more than five strikeouts. And Corbin Carroll had a hit, but he just needed to get that one stolen base. But Sleeper is the way to go. If you're in with fantasy baseball, I'll have a couple more picks for you later on in the show. Last night, the Royals lost at the hands of the Minnesota Twins 5 to nothing. They were shut out by Pablo Lopez, who had 12 Ks and had a complete game shutout for the first time in his young career. The pitcher the, the Twins acquired from the Marlins in the offseason, and he came into Minnesota to be the ace. Every time he's faced the Royals, he has done ace-type stuff, and last night, was the best that he's ever looked in his entire career. And this Royals team, I think, went into that game uh, trying a different approach against them, but clearly it wasn't working in any way, shape, or form. Lots of swings and misses. believe Pablo Lopez had 17 whiffs last night at Target Field against this Royals lineup. But his counterpart in the game, Alec Marsh, really intrigued me. And I tweeted this out last night. You can always follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. But last night... His stuff popped to me, and not so much as a starter, but much more as a reliever. I think the Royals are in a spot in this season where it's more so a tryout at this point. The wins and losses don't really matter. Another loss in the books isn't going to hurt this team. A win isn't going to do enough in the standings for it to truly matter. Of course, at this point, it's all about morale. You want to win as many games as you can, but as we've seen this year, this team loses a hell of a lot more than they win. So you look for the little things you can improve on, and you look for little victories. And last night, to me, was a victory with Alec Marsh. His numbers were not phenomenal. They weren't fantastic. But for his second big league start, I like the strikeout stuff. Last night, he goes five innings, did have three walks. Walks do tend to be a concern with him, but five strikeouts. And he had five strikeouts in five innings against the Dodgers last time out. So 10 Ks through his first 10 innings, I can live with that. I can live with that for a guy that I really didn't pinpoint as being a strikeout pitcher. But in five innings last night, we said 17 whiffs for Pablo Lopez. Alec Marsh had 15. He had a firm fastball, sat about 94 to 97, topping out at 97, that is. His curveball was really being placed well. And that changeup has a ton of movement. Contrary to Austin Cox, I think Alec Marsh can really transition into being a big back-end bullpen guy for this team in the future. I think when we're debating the young guys, the 2018, the 2019 class, we're hesitant from time to time about moving Brady Singer or Daniel Lynch to the bullpen. Some of you want Singer in the bullpen, but I see that as a failure for a first-round pick. Now, Brady Singer, I think, can still give you starter stuff, but of course, we've always discussed that third pitch needs to be a priority. Daniel Lynch, I don't see his stuff getting immensely better in the bullpen. Alec Marsh, I see something there. I see something 
with his fastball, with his curveball, where right now as a starter, he's already got good swing and miss stuff, but you put him in a back end spot, you put him in the seventh or the eighth inning, and you say, air it out, kid. Well, Alec Marsh goes from 94 to 97 to maybe 97 to 99 with that power curve and that good circle change. That, to me, is an intriguing part of this, and that's why last night it popped to me. I think he could be a fine starter, right? I think when the Royals are building the rotation, they're looking for youthful guys that can give them length, can be that bulldog for them. And yes, from time to time, he's going to get roughed up because that's what happens to rookie pitchers. But if you really do a deep dive into rookie pitchers and their numbers, look at Austin Cox. Austin Cox was great out of the bullpen for Kansas City. I was hesitant when they moved into the rotation because I said, he's thriving right now. There's no need to take him out of a spot where he thrives. And lo and behold, when he starts against Cleveland, when did he start getting roughed up? The third inning. And that's when those four runs came on a Jose Ramirez grand slam. First two, for the most part, pretty good because that's what he was wor- used to working with. That's what Austin Cox felt comfortable with. Alec Marsh, I've seen some outings where both times in his first two starts gave up a home run in the first inning. First batter ever faced, four pitches into the game, home run to Mookie Betts. Last night, it was Julian of the Twins going yard on him in the second at-bat of the game. But he settled in, and he found rhythm. He found his strikeout stuff, and I thought it was a decent start, a fine start for a guy that didn't get much work in AAA Omaha. But I just thought to myself, if you could give Alec Marsh one inning, and in the second half of the season, which inning would you give him? I might try a throw-in-the-fire type of mentality. I really like his stuff. That fastball is a lot harder than I thought it was. No, you sit 95 to 97 as a starter, that can get up to near triple digits in the bullpen. And he's got a ton of movement, a ton of movement on that curveball and that circle change. You work with that and only worry about three or four batters a game, I like my chances. We saw John Heasley make that outing on 4th of July. He came in in the bottom of the eighth inning against Minnesota. He's pumping 98. John Heasley, a failed starter, goes into the bullpen redefines that fastball. And I do want to see more outings from him, but redefines that fastball. He goes from 92 to 94 to 98. Three straight pitches, 97, 98, 98 to Joey Gallo. And a power slider now, that's what you can get with a failed starter. Now, Alec Marsh isn't a failed starter. And Royals Farm Report and I discussed this on Twitter that I believe Alec Marsh can go to the bullpen right now. I'd like to see Cole Reagans after the All-Star break in the rotation. I'd like to see Angel Serpa in the rotation after the All-Star break. Try out Alec Marsh in the bullpen. But we got in this debate, and I definitely agree with a lot of what he had to say. And simply put, said that, well, if Jonathan Heasley got as many starts as he did, I'd imagine he'll do the same for our, for Alec Marsh. Same thing with Austin Cox. You need to see if they're a starter first before they go to the bullpen. And I totally agree with that. That maybe you can see a little bit longer for Austin Cox and Alec Marsh out of the rotation. There is some more guys coming up from AAA Omaha that are going to get starts in the second half. But right now, these are two guys that are actively in the rotation until they get blown up or they really struggle to find that consistency or give you length in that fourth or fifth spot in the rotation. Then they're going to continue getting those starts. I just simply point out that I don't know if I ever see a long term starter in Alec Marsh or Austin Cox. I see back end relievers more so Marsh than Austin Cox. I think Austin Cox could be a long reliever, a two inning guy because he throws a lot of strikes, like Marsh from time to time, he can get a good amount of swing and miss. That's what I kind of want to start doing with the failed starters. You can't necessarily punt on them being a valuable player until you try them out in the bullpen. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But Austin Cox is 26, Alec Marsh is 25. They're not 21, 22-year-old young prospects. So you can try them out in this year in the rotation, but next year, I'm getting in that mode of let's see if these guys really can have great velocity, great stuff in a one or two inning role. I got the same feeling last night with Alec Marsh that I did with Carlos Hernandez in 2021. Remember that great stretch that Carlos Hernandez had in the second half? Good stuff. 97, 98, 99, big 12, six curveball, sat about 83 to 84. And everybody's saying that's a great starter. I thought to myself, he's fine for right now, but it's a bad team. You know, until he really logs innings for a team that's contending, I think about the possibilities of being a bullpen guy. And Carlos Hernandez was a younger guy. He's 24 years old, now about 26, going to be 27. But he's got that power heater 
And for one inning, he can go in there and air it out. And he's sitting 99 to 100 with his fastball. And he's been much more improved. This is the best version of Carlos Fernandez we've seen. I see that with Alec Marsh. I really do. Does it need to be this year? Not necessarily. I prefer it. But I know that's not going to be the case. When you have this minimal of pitching depth, you need to get as many innings as you can. I'd go with a six-man rotation and the second half. I know they're not moving on from Granke. I know they're not moving on from Jordan Lyles. You get Brady Singer, Daniel Lynch, Angel Serpa, and Cole Reagans. Then in the bullpen, you get Austin Cox. You get Alec Marsh. See where you go from there. Because once Barlow and Garrett are gone through trade, you're going to need guys in the back end of the bullpen. I don't need to see Taylor Clark anymore. I don't need to see Jose Quas. And I don't need to see some of the guys that are being moved up and down like a Nick Whitgren or a Colin Snyder. I don't need to see that. I want to see the young guys who really could have power stuff at the back end of that bullpen. I believe that Alec Marsh can give you that. When we come back here, let's continue our talk with the young players. Is there anybody on this team that deserves an extension? If so, who could that be? I'll tell you who coming up next on Locked On Royals. You are tuned in to Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore one five. And before we dive into some long-term extension candidates, let, let's give a shout out to today's title sponsor in Sleeper. And I've got some great picks for you here tonight. I was nearly right in yesterday's episode going with Alex Cobb of the Giants and going with Corbin Carroll of the Arizona Diamondbacks. Tonight, I'm going to pick another pitcher. And this guy's going for the Rangers at Fenway Park. It'll be Nathan Avaldi facing his former team. I'm going to take him to have more than five and a half strikeouts against this Boston lineup. And then I'm going to go to the home run derby participant out of Seattle. And that would be Julio Rodriguez. I expect him to have more than one and a half hits in this game. Seattle will be going up against the Astros on the road. So those are my two picks. Listen to me or don't. But if you want to make your own picks, just go to the Sleeper app. It is the exact thing you want to do when having fantasy baseball. You're wanting to make some great predictions on tonight's games, on tomorrow's games. This is the place to do it. Because do you want 100 times your money on daily fantasy baseball? Sleeper is now offering up to 100 times the payout for up to eight pick contests. Choose as many as eight players that you like and pick more or less on your favorite baseball stats like home runs, strikeouts, hits, and more. As of course, I just made my own predictions there with Julio Rodriguez and Nathan Avaldi. So get your picks right and you can win big with Sleeper. Now, to dive back in to some extension candidates for the Kansas City Royals, I think the common pick was always Bobby Wood Jr. Right When Bobby Wood Jr. was coming up to the system, you debated if they should go the Chicago White Sox route and give him the Luis Robert, the, LA, the Eloy Jimenez contract, where before he's even had a major league at bat, you give him a seven, eight-year deal, lock him up. Now, Bobby Wood Jr. and his father are smart people. They want to maybe bet on themselves more than just being locked down to a contract on a team that, who knows, the next time they make the postseason. Right now, it seems pretty grim for the future. You never know what can happen in the offseason, but Bobby Wood Jr.'s wanted to bet on himself. And I've been racking my brain with this as to if he's worth a long-term extension. I thought in this past offseason, Brady Singer was a for, for sure fire long-term extension candidate. I thought that he was going to be the guy that you locked down for three, four, maybe even five years. He's the number one of your staff. He showed it last year. He sure as hell can do it this year. I'm very glad the Royals did not lock up Brady Singer to a long-term extension because he's been so down this year aside from the last couple starts. But the guy to me who should be, and I at least have a hunch or a guess or a gut feeling this was going to be the case before he got hurt, I think the extension candidate you need to lock up for three to four years, maybe five, is Vinny Pasquantino, this Pasquatch for the Kansas City Royals. I've always believed since coming up to Kansas City, I know that was just last year, he's the best pure hitter on the team. Best approach, most power, most pop, hardest hit balls coming off the bat. To me, Vinny Pasquantino is that guy. I'm not worried about Vinny Pasquantino regressing. I think he's got a perfect approach. It really stings this lineup for the rest of the year, of course, that he's not in it. And I know that it kind of threw a monkey wrench in things to extend him when he's out for the year. But going into this offseason, that's the guy for me. And you can't tell me you're concerned about his progression when you gave 
Hunter Dozier a long-term deal. Now, that's maybe a bad example to try to convince you that Vinny Pasquantino is, but I really do believe that he can be your anchor on the first base side as the designated hitter for the next five years. I'm not worried in the slightest about Vinny Pasquantino coming back from injury and being a shell of of his former self. He, to me, is the best pure hitter, and he would be a top five hitter in a lot of lineups around baseball. He's got the pop. He's got the exit velocity. I think that with the shift being banned this year, he would have had all-star level numbers. Now, you ask yourself, well, what about that brutal stretch he had before the injury? Right? He wasn't playing at all-star level, and he was healthy. I have my doubts. I really do have my doubts that Vinny Pasquantino was banged up, or that wasn't banged up, excuse me, before he went on the I.L. and before he had season-ending injury. I think it was more so of a wear and tear thing. It was bothering him because you just didn't see the same Vinny Pasquantino. He's young enough where a four or five year deal would make a lot of sense. I think he's going to age well at the plate. I don't think you're going to have somebody that is just in his prime, has all this power, then at age 30, all drops off. No, he walks a lot. He's got the power numbers. I know he's not fantastic over there at first base, but he can play that spot. You can have him at first base in DH and kind of flip-flop and trade off with Nick Prado. He, to me, though, is the number one candidate. I I really do believe that's a safe bet. I think it'll be very affordable. The Royals are going to need to start deciding who they want to lock down. I know you don't want to talk about it right now in a season like this where it's all been about losing, but you need to start piecing together really who is your core. Oh, and John Sherman had his press conference of last week, it was, talked about finding the core to build around, to go help them in the offseason, to spend for those guys. Well, Vinny Pasquantino absolutely is in this core. I don't think there's any and, ifs, or buts about it. He is a part of this core. He's the best pure hitter. He's good enough defensively, and he's still young. I'd lock up Vinny Pasquantino this offseason. Coming off a long injury, coming off a season-ending surgery, all of that doesn't matter to me. Vinny Pasquantino needs to get that extension. He, to me, is absolutely the 1A candidate for me. Now, you're asking yourself, well, what about Bobby Wood Jr.? What about Michael Garcia? Bobby Wood Jr., I think, is going to get there. I don't think the Royals are going to let him walk down the road without an extension. They want him to be the cornerstone piece. But as we've discussed before on this this show, on this podcast, whatever you want to call it, Bobby Wood Jr. still has a couple missing parts to his game. The defense has been phenomenal this year. I think you're starting to see a future cornerstone piece. Still want to see the walk rate go up because that turns Bobby Witt Jr. from a two-war player to a five- or six-war player. I truly believe that in my heart. Same thing kind of with Michael Garcia, though his walk rate's better than Bobby Witt Jr., but they're kind of in the same category to me. Is Michael Garcia a long-term option? Is Bobby Witt Jr. a long-term option? I do want to see an entire year of Michael Garcia before I'd give him that contract. And I am as big of a Michael Garcia fan out there. I am in the Michael Garcia fan club. Absolutely 100%. I just need to see a little bit more. Now, there are ways to tinker with this, if you will. You could give Michael Garcia a five or six year deal and make it very cost effective, similar in the way that Salvador Perez got his deal way, way back. And I want to believe it was 2013 or 2014, where you lock him up for a long time, I know it wasn't really fair to him because he wasn't making what he was worth, but if you're not trying to break bank on three or four extensions, that's maybe one way to go about this. Garcia is a damn good player. You think he's going to be a great player. He's already good enough defensively at the hot corner, but how much better can he get at the plate? So if it's for the right price, if it's a team-friendly extension, I'd go for Michael Garcia. But I still want to see a full season over 300 ABs, what that power looks like, if that exit velocity continues to stay consistent, if the walk rate goes up at all, the the strikeout numbers, because at the end of the day, he's going to be figured out a little bit. That is going to be a concern for him, how pitchers adjust to him. And Bobby Wood Jr., he's already been through that. Pitchers have adjusted to him. We've seen the slumps. We've seen the peaks. We've seen the valleys. That's why I think with Bobby Wood Jr., you could get him for a better deal than if he's coming off an all-star year, right? If Bobby Wood Jr. was this team's all-star, He was pacing to be a five, six war player. You could have some trouble on your hands in locking down who is soon to be a multiple time all-star, maybe a top 10 MVP candidate. I mean, the possibilities could be endless. You could go about it this way. Look at how he finishes this year. If he's a 25 and 40 player, 
25 bombs, 40 stolen bases, something like that. On base percentage, just above 300 improvement from last year. But you bank on it only getting better, then yeah, I think a five, six, seven, maybe even an eight year deal is in the possibility. So to rank them, I'm going Vinny Pasquantino 1A here. And then 1B, I think I'm going Garcia because Garcia, I think, kind of like Pasquantino's, you're not breaking bank for. It. And I think you can kind of guarantee Michael Garcia being a pretty good third baseman long-term. And he's flexible. He can play short. He can play second. You're not locking him down to one spot for the rest of his career. He's young enough. I think he's only going to get better once he beefs up. Maybe the power shows a little bit more. Then I think Bobby Wood Jr.'s 1C for me. So they're all very much a high priority for Kansas City. But right now, that's my core. Those are three guys. That's my core. I'm building around three of the four guys in the infield. As for everybody else, it's kind of up in the air. I'm not willing to give that long-term extension. Now, where it gets interesting is, well, what happens if Frank Mozzicato gets to AAA and he's shoving in a year and a half? Maybe you give him that extension before he gets to Kansas City. Uh, maybe the guy you take in this year's draft just propels his way to AAA in a year. Maybe you give him the long-term extension. But right now, only three guys I'm truly comfortable with at the big league level to give those long-term extensions. It's Vinny Pasquantino for me, 1A. Michael Garcia, 1B, then I'll go Bobby Witt Jr., 1C. I might have a better feel of what those prices may look like, and we'll probably dedicate that to a show down the road. But to me right now, if I'm just going to lock up three players, listen to John Sherman, say we got to find a core, those are the three guys that I'm going to go with. Before we wrap it up here on Locked On Royals, we have our third part of this fun series we've been doing all week, and we'll have one more for you tomorrow ahead of Sunday's Major League Baseball draft. What prospect do I like? I gave you my first two, right? I had Kyle Teal if he falls to Kansas City. Then I had Matt Shaw, the second baseman out of Maryland. And now I got a guy that reminds me a lot of former Colorado Rocky, Carlos Gonzalez. That's Chase Davis of the Arizona Wildcats. I'll tell you about him next on Locked On Royals. You are tuned in to Locked On Royals and the Locked On Podcast Network. And as always, we want to thank you for making Locked On Royals your first listen Every single day, whether that be on Spotify, that be Apple Podcasts, that can be on YouTube, Amazon Music, all those platforms. You can never miss any of these episodes as long as you check us out on the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Johnson. Follow me on Twitter at Johnny J underscore 15. That's at J O H N Y J underscore one five. Now, before we go, there is one other prospect I want to give you as a college hitter. We'll have one more prospect tomorrow ahead of Sunday's Major League Baseball draft. But there's one more guy I want to get into here. He's my 1C option. If you were tuning in on Tuesday, our 1A option was Kyle Teal if he's available to Kansas City. Our 1B option was Matt Shaw, the second baseman out of Maryland. And 1C for me is Arizona's Chase Davis, who reminds me a lot, at least the swing, of former Colorado Rocky Carlos Gonzalez. Now, you look at the numbers – of Chase Davis in his junior year in the Pac-12 at Arizona. Played in 57 games, a triple slash of 362, 489, and a slug of 742, which of the first two guys I mentioned, and Kyle Teal and Matt Shaw, Chase Davis's slash line is a lot higher than both of them. His slug, at least, and 742. His OPS, also the highest of the three, and 1.231. He's got 21 home runs and 74 RBIs on the season. Of course, season's already concluded for Arizona, but he finished with that total. And then he's got 43 walks to 40 strikeouts. And I pointed that out with Matt Shaw of Maryland, why that was so important. And when we discuss about college, hitter, college hitters excuse me, and how quickly they can progress through the minor league level and then hopefully up to the big league level, and in this case in Kansas City, you want to be sure that they've got the best possible approach at the plate. You can always look at home runs, RBIs, doubles, batting average, triple slash, all of that. To me, what matters a lot with a college hitter is that walk rate. And with Matt Shaw of Maryland and Chase Davis of Arizona, both of them have incredible walk rates. And that's what the I would be searching for as a pure hitter in Kansas City. I've already discussed this on the podcast before, that when you're drafting and you're in the Royal spot, you're drafting for hitters and you're drafting for high ceiling hitters. Don't want to see a prep pitcher. Don't want to see a college arm. I want to see bats. I think you draft bats, you develop bats, and you go out and you buy pitching. Going through the, the drafting of college pitchers hasn't worked out that well for Kansas City. If you're wanting true upside players, I think there's a lot of hitters you can like, and Chase Davis for me is that third option 
if Kyle Teal and if for whatever reason Matt Shaw was not available. So these three guys are the ones I really, really, really like for the Royals. The reason I think I have Chase Davis a little bit lower than the two, I think I like the pop just a bit more from Matt Shaw. I think that he can progress a little bit quicker. I know the power is certainly there at a better level for Chase Davis. I'm also uh, maybe a little bit lenient towards an SEC player. I'm dra drafting a college hitter. I know for the ACC, you have Kyle Teal out of Virginia. He's more of an anomaly here. And then, of course, Maryland with Matt Shaw. But Chase Davis in the Pac-12, uh, the competition level can be a bit of a concern. I know you have Stanford in the Pac-12, but maybe at times that can inflate your numbers. But that's really the case with all college hitters, all college pitchers. Their numbers, the ones that go top 10, they're usually video game-like. Uh, those are the type of numbers that just baffle you, really. And to me, it feels like all three of these guys are great pure hitters. The upside-wise, though, it really is a close second and third for me with Matt Shaw and Chase Davis. And like I said, when I began this series, I'm fine with any one of these guys. Kyle Teal feels like a pipe dream to me. I bet he goes top six. But I do believe Matt Shaw and Chase Davis are going to be there. And then it comes down to who do you believe has the highest upside? How quickly can they impact you at the big league level? The reason I have Matt Shaw over Chase Davis is that I think Matt Shaw can get to Kansas City a little bit quicker than Chase Davis. But I'm not going to complain whatsoever if you go after a guy that reminds me a lot of Carlos Gonzalez. So he's my third pick here on my draft series of players I'd like to see the Royals take in the first round of the Major League Baseball draft. That happens on Sunday. And if you do want more draft coverage on the weekend, I'll be joining Royals Farm Report on Sunday for a quick Twitter spaces discussing who I want the Royals to take, if I've got any last minute changes, and maybe some guys that I wouldn't be as high on. Of course, you always want to take the guy with the highest ceiling, and the Royals are in a spot where they can have some time to develop guys. You can take a prep bat. Blake Mitchell comes to mind. The catcher, I think you could also go with Jacob Wilson, another college hitter, shortstop out of Grand Canyon. There are guys I really, really like that are going to be available, but as for right now, these are the top three guys I have in Kyle Teal, Matt Shaw, and Chase Davis out of the University of Arizona. That will conclude today's edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15 and shoot me any questions you may have. I always want to hear from the listeners. I want to hear your thoughts, your opinions, your questions. You can always do that right here on Locked On Royals. But until then, you take it easy, Kansas City.